Hello, good evening, welcome to our front. Tonight, we subject the very measures the Finance Minister of the Republic of Ghana is seeking to implement to actually cushion the people and also revive the economy. In this one hour engagement with the very best of the people who have been in that position before, who are currently industry players and also academics. You welcome back. This is Affront. My name is Raymond Daraqua. We will start a conversation with the economic section of what the finance minister told us after massive uh, push by the people for him to say something about what's happening in the current economy. The finance minister today took his turn, took, took us through what's been happening and ended up telling us what government is doing to make sure our lives are better in this country. At the core of it are some basic measures in the area of governance, in the area of energy, and also generally in the area of expenditure cuts. We'll be subjecting all of these proposals and measures to the scrutiny it deserves here. But let's start with the economy first and foremost. And I'll be soon joined by a former finance minister, the man who, who is the current minister's uh, predecessor, to understand what exactly these measures mean and how well, and whether or not they will work. The Honorable Secretary Pet joins us from the United States of America. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Raymond, and uh, good evening uh, to your uh, viewers and listeners. So, first, there's an admission that there's a lot wrong with the economy currently, but government is insisting that it's a compendium of external factors, recently compounded by the downgrades and the other things that are contributing to our current state. Nothing to do with mismanagement. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, let, me, let me just say that um, it is welcome for that concession to be made, you know, because you will remember, and even in this speech, even in this speech, as the fund had revised, you know, and um, now ratings agencies have revised our deficit, you know, uh, in the stellar years we were talking about, it was 7%. The minister keeps talking about 5%. Um, you know, the minister keeps quoting that figures that exclude, you know, the banking sector bill of cost and the energy sector bill of cost, which is included, you know, in amortization. Uh, the minister has not said anything. Is it true or false that we are sitting on huge areas, as the World Bank country director and others have said, equal to 5% of GDP, and therefore is the hole in which we are even deeper. So I'm saying that the position is okay, but the way to start a reform is to speak to Ghanaians about, you know, these realities. You know, are we are we going to see are we going to see an adjustment, you know, of the budget come, you know, may to reflect these realities so that we know whether the deficit facing us, you know, is nine percent, eleven percent or is something about 15%, percent, sixteen percent. So mm. I, I think that in as much as it is welcome, uh, Raymond, the point I wish to make is that the context, you know, did not concede to the fact that we had problems, you know, before COVID. And therefore, once you don't make that concession, you keep repeating the successes, you know, before COVID. Now the other point, yes, we had COVID. We've had crisis and we can come to those. But we also had resources. I had occasion to mention that this is the first government, you know, that has had five billion US dollars from various sources, including our own stabilization fund, to resolve this crisis. And within a year of receiving this money, we still have difficulties. Um, are we, you know, what happened? Does it bear to the fact that we did have a lot of problems? before COVID and after COVID. You know, some of the things would have been, you know, uh, uh, anticipated. So this is what I have to say by way of introduction. That the concession is okay, but then we have not seen an adjustment. We have not seen government conceding or otherwise telling us, you know, whether some of the things that are coming out now are the reality and therefore whether the problem is worse. Now, let's understand this perfectly. The conversation we are having is the finance minister telling us in this republic that we did very well before the crisis hit big, before we first had the COVID situation on our hands. Of course, on the average, they did GDP growth rate of 7% from 2017 to 2019. 
of course, 8.1, there are 6.5 and 6.3. These are good figures. But it was in 2020 that the COVID brought in the problems. And they believe that more recently, the addition of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis has worsened the international climate in a way that we are not immune from it. Far from what we've been made to believe by those in the minority that this is purely homegrown problems predominated by government's incompetence in the management and also government's inability to curtail is boring. The ministry and the minister is really not taking the blame for it. Well, that's the point. That is a problem. And we live to see, you know, as promised, the media review is now mandatory and we are going to have a remote. Problems have been through the uh, Iraq uh, wars, which are the effects, you know, on global finances. Governments have been through the global financial crisis. You know, governments have been through the break emerging markets, you know, funds that were taken out of the market, which the minister, by the way, is now saying occurred under this. Right? So this attitude of, you know, we are the ones with the most problems you know, it's unfortunate. Secondly, you will notice that in all these comparisons of 7%, they always go to the final year of the NDC, which is 2016, and say so the NDC did, you know, 3.6, old basis 2.8. They don't compare it to the final year of their crisis, which is 0 0.4. Why don't they go back and do an average, including the 11% or 14% GDP growth, which the Mayor Mahama did, and spread it through, you know, the 12, 7, 8 percent that we did before 2015, 2016, when we also faced those crises. The combination of, you know, lack of uh, gas from Nigeria, single spine, and all those things, you know. So this selectivity, you know, selectivism is not helping. Mm -hmm. You know, by the way, what Ghanaians need now, as I said, and let me repeat, is it true that we have a race that is up to 5 percent? which was accumulated before COVID? This is where the issue is coming from. Is it true, as we have been saying, that we have been burying, you know, the IPP, you know, uh, debt, which uh, even repay, repayments in amortization instead of showing them as a risk? And what happened to the ESLA funds that by their own concession in 2017 should have been paid, used to pay all these arrears? Are we going to see that adjustment? And that is the point we are making. You know, the World Bank and others, and they saying that the World Bank is so credible by saying that we had a raise of 5% of GDP. Are they saying that, you know, the ratings agencies and the rest, you know, uh, by the way, when the credit was being taken by the, for the ratings agencies upgrades, you know, how about, you know, now is it downgrade? You know, who, who are we deceiving by saying that you know, we're doing well when we have taken debt to 85% and it was above, you know, close to 70% if you add bail out costs and the rest. You know, so remember, and remember, we are talking about an economy that has expanded, an economy that brought great benefits to this administration by 2017, through 2017 to 2019. By 2020, you know, even the year, you know, of roughness, which is 2020, okay. the 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 uh, Nanago administration had gotten more oil revenue than most Mahama put together. Mm. Now, oil revenue. And yeah. as I said, in 2020, they got five billion to resolve the problems. I get you. We keep going back to all of those, you know, uh, uh, problems and saying that, yes. Th there's a point, though, that I need to put across. This point is to do with generally what you think about the measures that we will use to first revive the economy and also to cushion the people. As a way of preliminary remark on that matter, do you think when you put them together, they will achieve uh, the ends that we want to achieve and whether they are far reaching enough? Now, let's take it one by one. You know what revenue measures have been announced? We are talking about, right. for example, government of Ghana is supposed to conclude external financing arrangement of up to $2 billion in the next two to six weeks in line with approved external financing for 2022 and for liability management. Yes, mm -hmm. and we haven't been seen, we haven't seen the total picture. Remember, we couldn't go to the market for the same two billion. We were supposed to have five billion last year. We couldn't go to the market to get that two billion. We have carried over what areas have to be, uh, what deficit has to be financed by that two billion. So, is that two billion 
to make up for the shortfall last year, or it is for last year plus this year. Mm. So now, that's the note. And okay. if we get, sorry, and if, if we did, assuming it's 2 billion, right, and we have a deficit that is, you know, close to 5 billion, including refinancing and the rest, are we going to come to the capital markets? The minister did not say we are coming to the Ghanaian capital and the banking sector. What is the implications? Silence. What is the implications on interest rate? What is the implication on crowding? Government taking financing this huge deficit. So remember, with respect, remember I, I, I want you to answer that same question for me. On interest rates on crowded, what are the implications of some of these decisions? I'm saying I'm saying that if you take a government that needed five billion last year for deficit and for refinancing budget and other purposes, right? Then I'm saying that pinning the hope on two billion is not enough. Because the, the debt itself has gone up. And when the debt was lower, right, you needed more. So how about now that the debt has gone up? So why are we talking about $2 billion? Where you may probably be needing uh, $5 billion or $7 billion. And therefore, if you need, say, $5 billion, you know, which you couldn't get, in addition to the domestic financing, are you saying that you are therefore going to depend on the domestic market to finance the rest of the deficits? And that well, is where the question comes. Well, so Mr. that is the first measure, yes. Mr. Tekpe, let's look at the block in, in, in revenue measures too. The others are prioritizing the revenue assurance compliance and enforcement program this is to plug revenue leakages especially at the ports and the infamous fuel bunkering and small scale mining exporters cabal there's also one to do a government will partner the private sector to introduce digital systems to monitor sun when inquiring they get more revenue from natural resources immediately we are going to enforce can we can we take those two yeah because no, first of all okay yes the two you come later. So, uh, uh, let's, let's... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not let's sure. I, yes, I was hearing you properly. The question I was asking were to do with government's plans to ramp up, raise that program to plug leakages, and also to get more from the natural resources sector. We are also going to enforce no duty, no exit at the MPS terminal. Well, those are, those are, those are useful measures. Um, when it comes to the NPS terminal and some of these things have been done, but the problem, the question I'm asking is, you know, we spoke about the crowding. So this private sector initiative, are they going to bring their own money from outside, given the conditions that the government is going to create on the domestic market, you know, for those who are going to have to rely on the domestic market? And the revenue measures, are they broad enough? You know... No, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm asking you that question. Are they broad enough to fill up the gap that we currently have in our revenue space the answer is no the answer is no because to date you know ever since the domestic uh, uh, automation of the tax system was stopped in 2017 nothing has happened you know we didn't hear about the measures of course that will be that without that it is very difficult to link you know domestic you know mobilization of revenue with what is happening at the post which started under the single window you know, under the previous administration. So this is the problem that we're talking about. There is an introduction of a, a moratorium on establishment of new public sector institutions by the end of April 2022. They are also going to prioritize ongoing public projects over new projects. We are looking at the beginning of the introduction and collection of revised property rates by the end of April 2022. This has been long and going. And more importantly, we will implement the EVAT, e-commerce, e-gaming initiative by April ending too. There is also one that you should know about. They would impress upon Parliament to fast track the passage of the e-levy, tax exemptions bill, and the fees and charges bill. These are all major revenue measures to claw in the money that we have missed out in the first, almost ending first quarter of this year. Well, if the government is looking at the e-levy as a problem of the minority, then they are mistaken. Because me and you know that the opposition to the e-levy, which is taxation of savings, is more widespread, you know, than just the, you know, than the opposition in parliament. You know, they are just echoing. And mm -hmm. therefore, I think that if they take a good survey, they will realize that, you know, taxing savings is just, you know, anti-development. Now, we mentioned uh, uh, EVAT and the rest. Yes, EVAT initiative. If they want to bring it back, fair enough. Because it's part of the financial sector, 
the VAT measures that was cancelled in 2017, right? But I would also add that why don't they also continue and give back to business? Okay. Input, input VAT credit which they cancelled, which results in refunds for businesses that were cancelled, right? That is what will enable private sector. The, the expectation that it will bring in revenue is not being realized. You know, so this is my point. We are saying that there are measures which have been taken, including financing. You know, the minister spoke about not revising, you know, let it be clear, you know, uh, if real situation is not going, government initiatives may not go. Fine. And we going to continue depending on borrowing. Because, look, what we are saying is that, uh, yes, you may not want those things to go. But the answer is, how are you going to finance it? Remember, we all know already, and it bears repeating, that compensation and interest is taking all the rent. We all know that we cannot therefore finance even the rest of that. We all know that, you know, the recurrent expenditure where this financing of schools, apart from wages and other things, is 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 on loan. We all know, you know, that the capital infrastructure that is needed is on loan. Allowances to teachers is on loan. That is the rest of the budget. That is the practical meaning of saying that everything else is on budget. And you don't have access to the market. So how are you going to finance it? That is the question. Okay, so that question, that, that question, now I'm wrapping them up together and asking you three direct questions. Do you see in these revenue measures produced in the minister's statement something that will fix the current problem? We have the, the one, the minister did not say, right? According to Bank of Ghana, we couldn't meet our revenue target. Mm -hmm. We fell short you know, uh, by about 3 billion. At, seven, at seven, 70 billion and expecting to collect 100 billion was already a tough task. That's the GR official says, themselves said it was a toll of the Senate of and that's what they mean. He hasn't said anything, you know, that would give comfort, you know, that we are going to get, you know, an additional 30 billion, which is half, nearly half of what GR is bringing now. And if not, is the deficit not going to be wider? Are we not going to be doing borrowing? And therefore, that's the question. How are you, therefore, if you have been convinced us on that without any numbers, without any figures, how are you going to finance the expenditure initiatives that you do not want to bring down? Yes, as for a number of V8s and the rest, you know, that has always been done during austerity. And I'm, I'm really surprised, honestly, that at the time we had all these problems, government had in mind setting up more institutions in addition to you know, the British government said that it is becoming even an issue. It should have been a non issue at all. It shouldn't have been envisaged, given the problems that we had, that we were going to establish more institutions, let alone make it a plank, you know, for a recovery program. Now, there's a question about the expenditure side, too. Do you think that what is being proposed, the cutbacks, for example, discretionary spending area is actually going to be moved back by some 20%? Some are actually indicating that there isn't enough space to cut back in the first place. But is that 20% put together? All the cutbacks are supposed to result in some 3.5 billion savings in cities. Is this 3.5 billion enough to plug the hole? Well, government was not going to be able to finance those expenditures to begin with. And that is the practical meaning. Let me repeat. That is the practical, both discretionary expenditure. If your, your wages are beside compulsory, your uh, interest payment is statutory, your debt service, which is on loan, is statutory. So by the time you need this, debt service was not even part of it, the revenue is gone. So where were you going to get the money, you know, to finance those discretionary expenditures anyway? When you don't have access to the markets, when domestic interest rates are rising. You see the problem, right? So. Yes, government is talking about something which they cannot finance anyway, already, given that the, the given where we ended last year and where the first quarter is ending. So I don't see it as a measure that will make any substantive difference. Of course, it may limit borrowing, which is uh, which is good, but it is no structural measure, you know, to take us out of where we are. Now, my last question to you is: If you ask to propose to your successor, what is to be done immediately? to ramp up the revenue side and beat down expenditure 
and plug the current holes we have in the economy, what will be your immediate measure to him? Well, I mentioned it already, you know, that, hmm. you know, there was to be a domestic, you know, uh, automation of the system to link it, you know, to, you know, what was done from single window, which is now ICOMS, you know, so it's important that you have those initiatives in place, right? Because, for example, let me give you a practical example, saying that you are going to do automation or digitization, you know, when you cannot transfer data from customs to the domestic tax division, you know, are they going to do it manually? No. So that's phase two. That was stopped. You know, I was expecting to hear something about it, but there is nothing concrete, you know, about it. Maybe something is being done and by the media. You know, so in summary, what I'm saying is that the measures that have been announced, if you take them one by one, are other things that could not be financed by the government anyway, you know, and the other ones, you know, you know, it's like like a former president Mahama, you know, did. I remember he was derided when he said that as a signal, not because they may be substantive, but as a signal, you know, his ministers were going to take, you know, some cuts, you know, and other government appointees and the rest. He was derided. Now we are back to it. But those things are indicative because if you take the entire expenditure budget, they are not as substantive, but they show you know, leadership. So I think that we are seeing a reversal of many things that used to be derided. And it's very important that, you know, that's for that one, yes, a supporting move, but, but they are not going to make much difference to the deficits. They are not going to make much difference, therefore, to the borrowing and to the debt situation. In if there are any concrete, now hopefully we'll see some concrete numbers mm. before, in not effect, at the time of the media review. In effect, Mr. Tekpe, are you saying that these measures, regardless of where we put them, are not going to give us the results that we want? Well, I doubt it. The only positive thing I can see, you know, in terms of revenue flows, is the fact that oil revenue, revenue the prices for crude oil is very high. And a substantive amount of money will therefore go come into the budget. But remember, that's also, the minister mentioned it, that's also going out by way of uh, crude imports you know, to the extent that this is not enough, and therefore uh, we have margin cuts, you know, by uh, BDCs, we have margin cuts by OMCs and the rest, you know, um, recall. Nothing has been said about ESLA. What happened to the subsidy money that was flowing through ESLA? What happened to it? Was it part of what was used to go and take the ESLA loans, and therefore we cannot we do not have it now to flow into the budget because it's in servicing debt. Those are the substantive questions that we have. So we must probably commend, you know, the private sector, BDCs, OMCs, and the rest, IPTs, you know, okay. the IPTs and the rest, mm. you know, who are the ones who are now being called upon, you know, to give way to concessions and the rest so that, you know, government will be able to find its way. The government itself should, should take the lead in terms of structural reforms. I don't see any structural reforms in what has been presented. Many thanks to you, sir, for joining us right from your base in the United States of America. You attended the Kennedy program currently, and that is from our finance minister, Sektepe, who spent some time with us reviewing what his successor <coughs> is doing currently to bring relief to the people on one side and also to make sure that we bridge the current gaps in the uh, financing regime for our economy, both on the revenue side and also on the expenditure side. You heard his views about what ought to be done immediately. But they were not the only areas that had measures being introduced. You heard the former minister talk about ESLA and the fact that's Energy Sectors Levy Act. Now, let me go to the energy area because currently two of the biggest areas with problems have been one on the finance part two on the fuel part the fuel pricing has been galloping at the various pumps bringing so much distress to the people the minister introduced some measures on the ground let me get to the phone and speak to gabriel kumi he's the vice president of the lpg marketers association of ghana that group had seen a massive jump in LPG price, which used to be subsidized previously. And along the line, they actually got all the subsidies removed with current taxes on it. They've been demanding renewal or removal of some of these taxes. In all, fuel price has seen 15 pesos reduction per liter. Is this a step in the right direction? And does it affect LPG? Mr. Kumiya, welcome to our front. If you can hear Mr. Kumiya, welcome to our front. 
My good evening to your, your, your viewers. Now, let me go straight to asking you the question. We heard the minister raise the issues to do with the areas where we are cutting back, especially bust margin. UPPF, Unified Petroleum Pricing Fund, also going by that, down by 9 pesos, full market margin, 1 peso, primary distributing margin by 3 pesos, in all, 15 pesos, effective the 1st of April, we are seeing this reflecting at the pump. I want to know, does it mean that it's also going to reflect on the price buildup for LPG? Uh, thank you once again, Raymond. Um, uh, I've not had the time to go through uh, the minister's presentation uh, holistically, but if I, from what I've seen, it looks like uh, what I can conclude now is that uh, LPG was not affected. Because if you look at the, what was being mentioned, he specifically mentioned diesel and petrol, and 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 and, and is pushing for that uh, uh, 15 percent reduction in these two products. LPG was no longer, uh, it was nowhere mentioned in the, in the presentation. Mm. So you do not presume that wh wh what he meant was supposed to be for all fuel products, but specifically uh, diesel and petrol. That's what you want to believe. Yes, that, that's, that, that's my understanding. Unless maybe I'm, 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 I'm misunderstanding the presentation that the minister did. But if, if my understanding is correct, then it means um, LPG was not touched. And let me say that we are quite disappointed with that, but uh, we are not broken. We will continue to push for the right things to be done. First, you said you are disappointed. Exactly how precarious is the current pricing of LPG that makes not touching that part problematic? Uh, Raymond, currently LPG consumption in Ghana is under decline. And that should be a source of big worry to every Canadian. As I've always said, in 2019, we did an average of almost 30,000 metric tons a month. That came down to 29,000 metric tons a month in 2020. It came further down to 28,000 metric tons on the average in 2021. And this year, our projection is that LPG consumption is going to go further down to about 25,000 metric tons a month if the situation continues to persist. Uh, we, uh, I mean, our, our position on, 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 on the price of LPG has been made very, very, very clear over the years. We were saying we started calling for taxes to be removed and for measures to be put in place for LPG prices to go down in Ghana. No government official has been able to come out to challenge the, 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 the our position on this. Mm. That tells you that government itself sees the reasonable uh, argument we are trying to put, put across. But I think the courage is what we lack to be able to, to, to ensure that this is done. You have set a target to increase consumption of LPG. You have set a target to double consumption of LPG in 10 years. LPG is a product with an elastic demand. How can you achieve an increment in consumption while at the same time price of the product keep moving up. We have called for the taxes on the LPG as a, as a sign of commitment towards that objective that government has set. That is a, a fair step. Just take off the taxes from the product. Because you all know every, every Tesla increment in the price of the LPG goes to affect its consumption. Okay. Now, give me a second. Let me bring in now, um, get, let me bring in the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee in the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana, John Jinapo. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've, you. been in the, you've been in the energy ministry. I think at some point it was called Petroleum or so ministry. Now, there is an indication here from what is being put in the minister's statement. It says, these reductions in margins are expected to reduce prices of petrol by 1.6% and diesel by 1.54%. We anticipate that the measures taken to strengthen the currency will further stabilize the prices at the pump. First, do you get the impression that LPG was left out of this uh, reduction? Yes, I'm surprised that LPG hasn't been a major focus. In this era of climate change, carbon emission, and deforestation, if you look at the rate at which our forest is being degraded, it gives cause for worry. So if you read 
the Paris Agreement and all those SDGs and the uh, Millennium Development Goals and all that, clearly every country is trying to encourage the use of LPG, which is a cleaner fuel compared to biomass. And so uh, it's not for anything that we decided that we would integrate gas in our mainstream uh, fuel system. And so we build a turbo gas processing plant. That gas processing plant has the capacity at peak to produce close to 50% of national demand. The turbo gas has indicated that they have excess gas as we speak. And so I think that government should have looked at that. But you see, if you reduce um, petroleum prices by 15 pesos, what is the net effect? Like you said, the net effect is that you are reducing the prices by 1.4%. Already this year, petroleum prices at the pump have increased by about 66%. And so if prices have gone up by 66%, and you move the whole government machinery to brainstorm for four days, and the only thing they can do is to reduce fuel prices by about 1%. For me, that is shambolic. That is a drop in a mighty ocean. GPRTU and the transport unions have just indicated today that following this 1% increment, it is meaningless to them. And so they are going to increase transport fares. The problem we are facing is an issue of exchange rates. And the exchange rate has nothing to do with COVID Neither has it gotten anything to do with Ukraine because we are dealing with countries that have also been affected by COVID and Ukraine. COVID is not peculiar to Ghana. COVID is a global pandemic. Even nations that do not produce oil at all, they are doing better than Ghana. At least Ghana exports oil. And I heard the minister talk about windfall. Do you have the minister statement, Ray? Yes, I have the minister statement. Just, just, just a quick one. I want you to check on paragraph, paragraph twenty-two, if you have it. That's yes, I thing. have it. What does it say? Can, can you read that statement? Okay, so I would add that it says here the twenty-two, ladies and gentlemen. Um, government has already started new. Yes, the new. Sorry, okay. New year with spending cuts as Parliament failed to approve key revenue streams at the appropriate time. In January 2022, government announced and immediately began implementation of a 20% cut as part of a fiscal stabilization and debt sustainability. No, measure. no, no. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yes, that's 22. Please, please go to page 13, 25. I want to quickly read so that I don't waste your okay, time. Okay, yes. Yeah. If I'm right. Okay. In 2002, that is within the first paragraph, getting to the middle point. Oh, you mean 25? Yes, 25. Okay. In 2022, we exported 3.9 million of gas. This is supposed to be billion, not million. Okay. Wait. Yes. And then we imported 2.7. Is that not it? Yeah. And you say that Ghana's portion was 513 million. Is that not it? Yeah. So what I am saying is that when we talk of a windfall, it simply means that you projected to get X amount of money, but by the end of the period, you got Y amount of money, whereby X is less than Y. Mm -hmm. That is a windfall. It's as simple as that. It has nothing to do with what was exported and what was imported. Okay. The windfall is on our exports. Did we make a windfall or not? Secondly, when you look at our imports, gross is less than our export. Is that not the case? Yeah. That should be strengthening your dollar. Because your dollar is a function of imports and exports. And when even the oil companies take these monies, they bring some of the monies back into the economy. Because they also must incur certain expenditure in terms of other services. So what the minister did was very, very disingenuous in my opinion. And the minister deliberately refused to touch the taxes. Now these OMCs, and I'm happy my friend is on the line. You have increased the prime rate. What it means is that the cost of borrowing is going to be high for them. What it means is that even at their current margins, when they are posting bonds to the BDCs, when they are establishing letters of credit, it will cost them more. Cost of doing business is going to increase more. You will find it prudent to reduce their margins. But you as government, you are not prepared to even move by 1%. 
because taxes have been reduced by even 1%. That is most unfortunate. In my opinion, look, what the minister did today is much nothing I do by about nothing because I don't see what is going to come out of it. He talks of travels. How much are we saving? We don't know. He talks of vehicles. How much are we saving? We don't know. He talks about salaries. How much are we saving from that? We don't know. But in all, we are talks, targeting 3.5 billion. That's substantive, isn't it? 3.5 billion of what? Cities in all said all of these measures will yield the cuts, the various, uh, what they call it, revenue, the, the, the various cuts by government officials in various fields is supposed to rake in some 3.5 billion. That would have been money we needed, right? That's half of what. No, he says that, he says in paragraph 22, like you were reading, yeah. that there's a 20% expenditure cut. Yeah. A total expenditure is about 137%. If you cut that by 20%, you don't even need to borrow money again. And yet the minister wants to borrow two billion. So where is the policy consistency? If you cut your expenditure mm -hmm. by 20%, and I can just do a quick analysis of what 20% translates into when you put 137 billion. But that to be is fair, a colossal amount. We know that this would definitely be for the discretionary spending area and not necessarily the entire expenditure. There are parts you know we cannot touch. You know that, right? He says in January 2022, mm -hmm. government announced and immediately implementing a 20% expenditure cut. It's absolute. Yeah. He didn't say on uh, capital expenditure, on goods and services, on discretionary. He says 20%. So but even the messaging... Is problematic but to be fair there are areas he mentioned in the subsequent paragraph he said this has been done through the quarterly expenditure ceiling allotments to mdas quarter one allotment is currently under implementation while quarter two will be issued simply the ministry has spent as strengthened this expenditure monetary systems and processes the effective implementation of these measures in as this government has decided to take another other forms of measures to deal with that thing it, it actually directs where it's supposed to be happening isn't it so therefore, you are not cutting 20% of expenditure. In its entirety, yes. If you are cutting 20% of MMDs, then you see, what I'm saying is simple. Please, let's break this down into simple analysis. Yeah. What does the 20% translate into in terms of actual figures from the MMDs? What does 50% cut in coupons translate into in terms of figures? Oh, you don't get my point. I get you your point. Except that he put all together and said 3.5 billion. See this, yeah. So we are reducing our total expenditure by just 3.5 billion. Is that what you say? That's what he said the cuts would actually end your to. So what is the total amount in terms of cuts? Because that is the global picture. We okay, I get you. Yeah, I understand that. We yeah. have revenues. Mm -hmm. These are subsets. When you put all these subsets together into a global picture, how much is the minister reducing in terms of expenditure so I... that you then meet your 7.5? Because if it's just 3.5, then you wouldn't meet the deficit target of 7.5. Because already, interest payment alone, if you do the weighted average of the CD's depreciation and hit it against our external debt, that is more than the 3.5 billion. What were you expecting him to do? Specifically. One. On four prices, one, for example. One, deal with the taxes. That is the main thing. The taxes on the four prices. That Specifically, is one. which ones did you want him to remove? There is no need to have the special petroleum tax. The, SP, the special petroleum tax, the SPT. Even if you have it, that's a huge amount. It means that you are reducing 23 percent not infinitum reduce it whilst you tackle the exchange rate volatility mm. when the exchange rate appreciates and the prices begin to come down then you can gradually reintroduce the special petroleum tax because you are in crisis two is that we are an exporter of petroleum products the windfall that we get i'm not talking of the original amount we budgeted 61 per barrel Today, we are doing about 100 per barrel. What it means is that you are getting about 60% more than you projected for. Part of that money can fill the void when you reduce the SPT because it's a function of revenue that you need in order to meet your expenditure. But more importantly, 
I am so disappointed that the minister didn't even talk about the medium to long term. Because we are in this problem because we have failed to plan in the past. So even as you are talking of short-term measures, you ought to send assurance to the people of Ghana that in the medium term to long term, you would expand our trouble so that the gas and LPG that we are talking of, Ghana can be self-sufficient. Okay. Both your currency. Then your own crude, you ought to be processing it here. It bolsters your currency. Then more importantly, the wastage in the public sector. Why would you have the Department of Education? You have district directors, headmasters, and all that, and still set up a separate office that runs free education. That runs the food that you give to these schools. All those things are a waste. MPA alone, under our regime, we never had a deputy at MPA. Today we have two deputies. So if we give them even 50% coupon in terms of fuel, and they still keep their vehicles, that's not, not add on to the expenditure. Look, this is not enough. This is just a scratch on the back. It would not yield anything substantial. And mark my words, in a year's time, we might come back to this same problem. I guess I can leave it off here with you and uh, let you go. But let me conclude with Gabriel Kumi, who's also joining. So, Gabriel, where do we go from here? Exactly what do you think can be done in the interim, especially on the LPG clarification that's required? What else is required to make sure that LPG consumers are better off? Hmm. Uh, Raymond, I'm just, I'm just hoping that um, uh, LPG will eventually be included in this, even though from the, from the surface of the, of the presentation, we see that LPG was left out. Mm. I, I think LPG should have even been the first for that to tackle. If you really want to cushion the poor, and if you really, really are serious at, at, at doubling consumption of LPG in Ghana. But as it is now, as it stands now, uh, we don't see that happening. And, and, and the only way out is government to take measures to bring prices of LPG down. We as marketers are engaged in buying and selling. When you go to buy, when you go to the BDC, they can buy it and sell it at 10 cities. You only have to add your taxes and your margins to it and sell it at 12 cities or 11 cities. It's only government that can say that, look, I'm taking off all my 16% taxes of the product. And we have even been calling for measures to, to, to sort of subsidize the product for even the rural folks. Go to Cote d'Ivoire. If you go to Cote d'Ivoire, our neighboring country, Cote d'Ivoire, you are subsidizing the RPG to the tune of about 25%. <laughs> so, uh, is Cote d'Ivoire better than that? Because they know the strategic importance and the strategic nature of the product. Ghana's forest is the fastest depleting in West Africa. And what are we depleting all this forest for? For charcoal and for wood fuel. The only way to save our forest, the only way we can save our river. The only way we can save our environment and eventually save Madagascar is to ensure that we improve on our consumption of LPG. If we don't do that, I tell you, there's a saying that when the last tree dies, the last man dies. I am grateful to you, and that's some clarification we should seek on whether or not this involves it. But that's where we'll leave this. Many thanks to you, Gabriel and John Jinapo, for joining us for the energy section of the conversation. If you really went through the statement, there's a part of it that's also striking. That is the governance measures that have been taken in this presentation by the minister. Some of the very interesting things, one man had written a letter to the office of the president demanding that some of these things be done. His name is Professor Russell Jampo. He, he is a professor at the University of Ghana in the political science department. Prof, you're welcome to our front. Hi, Raymond. Thank you. Now, in a sum, the things you have heard government say it's going to do by cutting the areas that is going to actually implement these cuts, are you impressed with the decision to do these things? Well, um, we are uh, facing hardships and as a nation, we were expecting some of these things um, to be done. And um, more so um, because um, people have raised concerns and recommendations have been made and proposals have been uh, made and submitted to the government um, uh, as 
regards how things can be done, I mean, I was expecting that um, some of these interventions would be um, um, unearthed and be um, presented to us. You are asking whether I am satisfied about um, what we've been told. Well, I am a bit elated that um, uh, uh, some of the things that I said have been taken on board, but I don't want to believe or so fully believe that it is because I said so. Maybe um, some of the things that I said coincidentally found their way into the proposal that are to be implemented to help salvage the current situation in which we find ourselves. What would make me more excited is about implementation. Mm. The problems of public policy all over Africa and in many developing countries is about implementation. Fine blueprints are there, even as we speak now, regarding how things could be done to solve our problems as a developing country. They are just on the shelves gathering dust. And so these are nice things that have been said, but the problem is, will they be implemented? Should they be implemented, then I think we may, we may see some progress. Uh, but um, oftentimes these things are said and they don't get implemented. I also think some more could have been done by way of proposals to uh, reduce um, uh, spending and to help uh, deal with the challenges. I was looking at government reducing the size of uh, the number of its appointees and ministers, and then also realigning some ministries to okay. other ministries just to be able to downsize the size of government. Again, I was looking at, if you look at all the things that have been said, the most confusing thing that um, um, uh, uh, um, that, 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 that I heard was uh, the government's position on, on, on free SHS. It appears that there is communication, but, uh, it, but whatever is communicated is fought with a certain confusion because um, at one point in time we were told that they were going to review. We are in hardship. And so if you tell us that you are going to review spending, uh, in an area like free SHS, then automatically, or it's no brainer for anybody to think that you are going to be cut and spend it there. I don't know whether you get you are Yeah, I get you, yeah. We are in difficult times, and austerity measures are being fashioned out. And so if you tell me that you are going to reduce spending in flagship, uh, in, in implementing flagship programs, then what comes to my mind uh, is that it may be cutting spending, but at the same time, we have been told that you know it's not about cutting spending; um, it's about improving it. Um, I think that clearly, ever since this flagship and signature project was introduced, um, we have seen how it has fed. Uh, government is committed, or the, the the committed resources of government to making this project survive um, have not been adequate. And so if you have a ward in the various uh, secondary schools, SHS, and you go visit, you see the challenges that are there. Unfortunately, the heads of these schools are not able to voice these challenges out for fear of victimization. And so there are serious challenges. I have a ward uh, in an SHS, and I've been going there this weekend. Last weekend I was there. We see the challenges um, that are there. And so the point is that uh, it's been several proposals have been made that uh, uh, government may want to still stick to its free uh, SHS project. But why won't you allow those people who can pay to pay? And then also, um, if that is not the case, why won't we limit the SHS to only day students, free SHS to day students? So everybody gets free SHS, but those who want to lodge there, who want to enjoy boarding facilities, to pay for those boarding and lodging, uh, I think this um, would help to also ease the pressure 
on our public press. And I was I was hoping that this would um, feature in the budget that were proposed. But um, it appears government cannot do it all, but at the same time, it is refusing to accept help from mm. people who genuinely want to help to make sure that the, that the system um, um, is improved. And especially I'm referring to um, the current challenges of the free SHS. You are a journalist. Send people to the various tertiary and secondary schools and find out. You see very serious problems that they have. Of the feeding, um, um, shortage of teachers, the class sizes, uh, um, being, uh, being ballooned, and uh, infrastructure, limited infrastructure. So many things that have doused quality you know, at the level of quality of teaching and education at the level of the SHS. Uh, SHS. And I was hoping that uh, government would um, openly accept some of these uh, proposals that have been made. That look, you mean well to make SHS uh, free for people, particularly the poor, and it's a laudable uh, intention and initiative. But you don't have to pay for those who can pay. And so now, even headmistress and headmasters are, are, are scared when parents, teachers. Uh, our parents want to make contributions and donations to help support, you know, um, the schooling system at the SHS level. Uh, it is, it is, it is bad, and uh, I think that government cannot do it all by itself. And it's important that it is told in the face that you can't do it all, and you attempt to take all that responsibility and undermine the quality because you don't have the resources. Mm. So it undermines education at that level. And I was hoping and thinking that. Um, this would have featured in the proposals that were made, but then um, it appears that government can't do it all by itself. Exactly. It doesn't want to receive help from people who would help. My last question to you, to even end this conversation, there was also another mention of university education in all of this. The indication for government is that finally it will win off some of the tertiary institutions so that they can be given specific uh, designated amounts to be on their own. Step in the right direction? Well, we've always argued that government should win its support or win itself of tertiary institutions and allow the tertiary institutions to raise their own money. You know, the universities are unable to even increase their fees unless they go to parliament to seek approval. Mm -hmm. And for so many years, they've not been able to do so. They don't be unable to even increase fees. Compare the money that students in regular public uh, uh, universities pay to okay. their counterparts in private um, universities in Ghana. And you see that we are just not being serious with uh, what we want to do in terms of the, uh, allowing the universities to run effectively. And so during uh, the first uh, impact between UTAG and uh, government, some of us made this proposal that it's important that government allow the universities to run themselves. And running themselves would be would mean that there will be a little adjustment, upward adjustment in the fees that school students pay, so that some of the, the proceeds can be used to um, um, mm -hmm. pay um, lectures and to also provide or beef up the infrastructure um, of these various universities, rather than always waiting for government subventions that delays and government subversions that are woefully inadequate, government subversions that are not able to do anything for the universities and for expanding their infrastructure. I am most grateful to you for your time this evening, Prof, and I appreciate your, your, you joining us for this conversation. My pleasure. What well, folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. Many thanks to you for joining us. We've been giving a panoramic view of what's happening when it comes to the new measures being introduced with various reactions to it. You can take your own view of it. We did a poll on what you thought about these measures. Uh, well, okay, it still suggests that more than 70% of you are not so impressed with it. You can also join that poll as it's still ongoing. Thank you so much for joining Upfront today.